Today we'll uh, go through chapter five, light uh, wood frame construction. Um, framing is quite popular and common in the United States. However, it's not in other parts of the world. Uh, a lot of buildings and other parts are built from concrete frame structures. So this is somewhat unique to the United States. But uh, framing started for residential and commercial many, many years ago. And it evolved to some degree. The, one of the first types of framing they had was called balloon framing. Balloon framing is simply when you have framing members on the outside of the structures that ex actually extended for two floors. And you would have the first floor, and and you'd have the second floor all connected to one single two by four member that stretched that height. And there were they had special ways of notching and connecting the uh, second floor members onto that framing. That uh, lost its popularity through time. One because it became a little more difficult to assemble because you had to assemble two full floors. And frankly, the biggest reason to stop this, because you'd have to have a two by four if you're doing the outside framing wall that was straight for about 17 feet long. And then that became a problem because lumber became more and more distorted, I think, as the quality went down. So they opted out to change and go to a more common, what is used today, it's called platform framing. And platform framing is simply where you have built one floor on top of the other. So you would have your first floor studs and you're buried on top of the second floor framing. Or as I said, second floor framing buried on top of the first one. That's your platform framing. And then you just keep building on top of that. This is quite common, up to four stories. There's a lot of four-story hotels and motels that are built around the country out of wood framing. The, um, <clears throat> there's two types of lumber that's used and they're referenced as dimensional lumber and board lumber. Dimensional lumber is your, basically your two bys. Two by fours, sixes, eights, tens, and 12s. Your dimensional lumber are one by one by four, I'm sorry, your board lumber, one by six, one by eight, one by 10, and one by 12. And the difference is it's nominal uh, uh, dimension. When we refer to a two by four, we're talking about its cross sectional area. In the old, old days, around the turn of the century, that'd be the 1900s, the a two by four actually measured two inches by four inches. As a result of the First World War, the lumber industry went to the um, National Bureau of Standards in Washington and said that we need to conserve lumber. So we asked at that time, they requested that the actual lumbers be changed to a, a dimension of three and a half one and three quarters, excuse me, by three and three quarters. And they were granted permission to do that. And then up <clears throat> until then we had the Second World War again, and then they changed, went back, and they changed that dimensional again so that those lumber pieces were one and five eighths by three and five eighths. And then in the 60s, again, they made another change, and they had the actual uh, lumber as it is today now, so a, a two by four is actually one and a half by three and a half. So that's its actual dimension. Uh, you're required to, when you draw it, that you actually draw it at the one and a half by three inch, but yet its nomenclature is a two by four or two by eight or two by ten or whatever the case may be. Uh, <clears throat> there is Requirements in the building code as far as what do you use when. If we start with the exterior framing, uh, 
I'm sorry, let's start with our, our loading factors. Um, we look at the tables in the building codes and in the um, manufactured literatures, you will find span tables. And uh, they will have things like if you have a uh, 40 pounds per square foot of live load, whether it be snow or live load or whichever it is, and might have 10 pounds per square foot of dead load. The charts would then indicate you uh, to you what size members are needed, whether it be 2x10s, 2x12s, and the spacing standard as we know it is 16 inches on center. And that's a derivative of our four foot module that we use for construction. Because there are three spaces at 16 inches equal four feet. That's why a sheet of plywood is four feet by eight feet. And again, that's used throughout the whole construction industry. And as things, as spans get larger, we look at alternates as far as its framing members. Uh, if you use standard floor joists, let's say they're 2 by 10s there's a limit as to how far you can span. Uh, you would end up, here's a standard framing section for a single story uh, wood frame structure. Or you have the floor joists here. There's going to be a limitation on that span. And that, you know, roughly is going to be a neighborhood of about 12 feet from outside wall to its end. In this case, there happens to be an 8 inch beam here, and we put a framing member on top of that. Now, with these kind of standard dimensional numbers, that means you can only you have a limitation on your spans. Well, the industry changed and decided to use some other members. One of the more popular ones was called an eye joist. That is a member that is literally manufactured and its profile or section looks like so and they vary from heights anywhere from 8 inches up to 16 inches in depth and what they do is they'll span a much larger space like up to 24 feet or so in length and what that does is yes you pay a little more for the engineer uh, member but then you eliminate the cost of these other framing members in the middle and now you have a more flexible room and usually this is done in a basement setting so that you have a more open space but these are typically manufactured and they're cut per size at each location they also have actual joists and I've seen those too uh, used and, and, and these would be for larger spans so if I take a look at this in section but you have, you have a, I'm sorry, an elevation. You have a top cord and a bottom cord, and the members look like so. These are actually called trusses. And those are for much larger spans, and you could easily go up to 60 feet on trusses and so forth. So those are the general uh, uh, framing members that are used. Um, one of the things that you are uh, have to be careful about is that these members have a tend to rotate uh, or racking as it's sometimes called it. So if you put a load on a member uh, like so, it has a tendency to want to rotate and lay flat. So to prevent that, they, uh, we use what's called bridging or bracing. So if you take a look at two by members, and what they do is they provide this cross bracing at each of the locations and usually it's at mid-span and uh, the most common one are one by threes they're just simply nailed and it keeps the members from racking under the high loads that it may impose on them. Uh, also when we look at floor framing <coughs> we need to examine uh, penetrations uh, you always are going to have some kind of openings or penetrations on flooring. 
So if you have this frame, remember, and if I'm looking down at a plan, and this is my framing, and I have these members that are 20, at 16 inches on center, at some point, let's say I'm going to have a stairwell open. Well, what you have to then do is allow for that. And typically, what we end up doing is putting doubles or triples at these opening locations and simply frame in the balance of the flooring like so. So these are actual floor joists and at the actual, this is the stairwell opening and openings are typically designated with an X through them so that you have double members here, double members here, and double members here to pick up the opening. If it's a much larger opening, it may have to be triple members. As far as, and then these are actually joist hangers in, in cases of here and here. Uh, the joist hangers are simply metal straps, if you will. They look like so. And there's a piece, actually, if I drill this in more uh, of a perspective. They would look like so. And the two by member actually sits into this here. It is anchored into the two by member and then anchored to its framing member. And again, those are metal joist hangers and they vary in depth from uh, six inches up to 10 inches. And again, they transfer the load from one member to another member without bearing on top of the actual transfer. Uh, form the load into the same member at the same plane. Okay, with all that said, let's take a look at actual framing members, uh, specifically walls. You have two types of walls. You have a load-bearing and a non-load-bearing wall. A load-bearing wall is a wall, like the name implies, is accepting an external load, such as a snow load or a live load for, for a frame. You have, uh, and those are typically on the perimeter walls of the structure. Yes, you have sometimes interior load-bearing walls, but in most cases, interior walls are not load-bearing. Uh, so what we have here is, if we take a look at our wall, and we look at it in elevation, you start out with a bottom plate, like so. And if I were to draw that in section, you simply have a two by member here. And rough lumber is designated with an X through it. Then you would have your top plate, or plates, in this case, you would have two top plates. So that again, if you were to take a look at this in section, that's what you would see. So you have two top plates. And this could be two by fours, it could be two by sixes. I think you're too straight there, didn't I? Let me try and see if I can correct that. And then you have your stud member. And these are your 16 inch on center studs. So every 16 inches you have a two by member. And usually for walls it's two by fours. In some cases it's two by sixes. Then you get into a situation where you have an opening like a window. Well you need to frame around 
And what you end up doing is depending on the the opening width. You are framing it like so. So let's go through and see if we understand what these are. This is your base plate. This is your two top plates. These are your studs. Ouch, I'm sorry, my shoulder. And then when you come to your opening, again, this is going to be your window opening. This is your header. And when you come to the opening, this stud here is called a king stud. This one here that actually transfers a load is your jack stud. And you can see that this header is bearing on top of the jack stud here. Now, if you have a larger opening, you'll have more jack studs. On large openings, like 16 feet or 14 feet, it, you, could pro you would probably have three jack studs there. There's actual a table that you look at, and you can see the load on it. These are called crippler studs. They're basically fillers. And this is the sill plate. And that's a standard opening. What happens is you are taking the load that's from above, whether it be another floor or roof load, transferring it through the two by uh, top, the double top plates, and then it goes into the king stud. In this case, the load over the opening is transferred down the cripplers, into the headers, and then into these jack studs they take the load down into the flooring uh, members. <coughs> and again, that's a standard uh, framing wall on the outside. This is, it's the same process when you have this for doors. The exception is you just don't have anything below here and this would be your door frame. <coughs> Uh, when you get into garage doors or, or larger openings, then you have a much larger span and that um, uh, requires a little different framing for the headers, but the, the king and the jack studs are the same uh, configuration except, you know, large opening. You may have four jack studs that carry a large opening for a door. One thing you need to concern yourself with, uh, okay, excuse me, if I I continue this section that I started and I were to draw my header that would be my header and if this is a, a two by four that's actually three and a half inches and what you end up doing is you need a spacer so you end up having a spacer and that's typically a plywood spacer for uh, the headers. And again, the typical framing members are at 16 inches on center. Uh, these are 2 by members and again, uh, there's a chart and these could be 2 by 8s or whatever, 2 by 6s, 2 by 10s. It'll vary depending on the size of the opening and actual the loading above it. Um, in, if you look at a the walls of a 
uh, of a building. Let's keep it simple. And if we have something that looks like this, One of the forces imposed on this are going to be wind loads. So you get a force of a wind load. It's a, it's a horizontal load. Uh, they've just changed that in the code and now <coughs> the requirements are 115 miles per hour of wind load, which is a pretty significant force. This was a result, they changed the codes as a result of the Hurricane Katrina that happened some years ago in the Gulf. And what happens is when you have a force on this kind of, uh, of structure, it wants to start to rotate. So you have to resist those forces by strengthening the corridors. And in the old days, they would provide one by four bracing, bridging, bracing, excuse me. And they would be let into the two by four studs. But now, the, that got to be a little, get to be more expensive. So what they've done now is they simply will sheathe the whole house with four by eight sheets of OSB, or the, or the, I should say, not just the house, but any wood frame structure. So that that plywood or that OSB board keeps the building from rotating and from racking or from distorting. All right. Um, this is a pre-drawn uh, building section, and it starts from the top of the foundation, goes to the roof line. And I, what I want to do, you can see the overall, then what we'll do is I'll draw the components and show you how they are assembled. If you start the section at the top of the foundation, the first requirement is that you have a sill plate or a nailer. Uh, the, and the code requires that the minimum is a 2 by 4 nailer. And that nailer must be anchored into the foundation system. Depending on uh, whether it's a block or it's a concrete. It's 8 inches or 15 inches depending on uh, whether it's a, uh, in this case, this is concrete and this is a block. This length. This nailer, uh, previous to the um, in the 70s, um, wood frame structures sat on top of foundation, and that there was not a, a mechanism to anchor them to the foundation because they felt that it was not needed, simply because the gravity load of the materials would keep it from shifting. That was true until about the 70s, and specifically in Michigan they changed the code. In, I believe it was 76, they had a tornado that ran through uh, Bloomfield, West Bloomfield at Orchard Lake in 15 mile. And it actually, I remember seeing some of the photos where it actually shifted some of the buildings off of the foundations. And they were not anchored. So I remember seeing one house where it shifted so far that it, it actually was leaning on uh, the whole structure. So they then said, you know what, we need to anchor that uh, house to the foundation. And you can't just simply nail wood to concrete or wood to block. So they came up with the system where they you put this, and it's shown in the book too, where you have these, in this case they had a half inch diameter bolts, about every eight feet in the foundation. And you take this member and you pre-drill the holes every eight feet and you slip it over and you put a nut on top of this and then that is affixed to the foundation. And then you come back with the floor choice and they bear on top of that and they have what's called a rim joist. This is a rim joist. And this is a floor joist. And again, the standard is that they are 16 inches on center. And then uh, once the floor framing is done, then you come back and you put your sheathing. And typically this is a half inch sheathing.
In most cases, this is OSB or orientated strand board. Uh, sometimes they used to use plywood. The plywood was really an over design on the system, so they are now using the OSBs. What you have that flooring down, and you come back with your wall. And you start out with, as I drew it, your, uh, your sill plate, and your uh, double uh, top plate. In this case, those are two two lines. And these are your studs. In this case, it's called 2x4s at 16 inches on center. And then from this point, you can either build another floor, which would be the same assembly as this on top of that, or if it's a single story, you would go into a roof frame. In this particular case, I have this as conventional framing, meaning that it's out of two by members, and we have our roof rafters here at an angle and then your ceiling joints. Um, and then we have these collar ties, collar beams, every four feet to keep the roof from uh, any kind of deflection. Uh, the, they used to build almost all roofing framing from this type of construction. Then trusses became more and more popular in the 50s. And now almost all of the construction on roofs are done with trusses. The pre-engineered, uh, almost all of them are made out of 2x4 framing members. You have a 2x4 member on, on the uh, horizontal, and then you have your roof framing that goes up like so. And again, no, that's all one pre-engineered truss, and you, you've seen it if you go out on, on any of the field trusses. And they'll simply bear on top of these top plates and all that framing. Then here again, you would come back with sheathing. This actually is, I drew this incorrectly in that uh, this would have a vertical cut to it. So that you could have your overhang. And these trusses are typically, your trusses are, uh, since it's a roof framing, it's 24 inches on center, not 16 inches, where you have a much greater load because of the floor loads. <coughs> uh, by example, uh, the first floor load is required to have a 40 pounds per square foot of live load. And usually that load is about 10 pounds. On a roofing load, depending on where you are, uh, starting in lower Michigan in the southeast area, up to about eight mile road, the snow load is two, uh, 20 pounds a square foot. And as you move up the state of Michigan, all the way up to the Leeuwenhoff Peninsula at the very top, uh, you have now snow loads of 90 pounds a square foot. So it makes a difference where you are, and so that this framing would be different members in different spaces. Uh, they would be using them at 12 inches on center in those areas. The um, roof itself is, there's, there's several types of roof. Um, there, uh, and actually it's shown in the textbook, and let me find the page here. Now most of what I'm pulling here is from the textbook anyway, so it uh, should not be difficult to follow. Okay, I guess I should have had this tag, but I did not. On page 210, it shows the different types of roof. They start out with some of the basics if you look at the roof. And these are your walls, 
they have what's called a shed roof so that it slopes from front to back. So it's a very simple uh, uh, roofing. That's the shed. Then you have the gable, simply where you have roofs that slope in two different directions. Then they came out what's called a hip roof. And you look at it, and it looks like so. And that's the hip roof. And those are the, the most common types of roof framing. Um, here is a roof plan. And each one of these members, and this is also in the book, you can see it's page 214. Uh, they have all the different members. Uh, members here, that's the ridge beam. These are the uh, hip rafters. This is the valley. So these are considered valley jack rafters. These are regular roof rafters, common rafters. This is a hip rafter, etc. They all have some nomenclature. This is a fascia board that goes around the whole house. Um, because of the construction industry, unlike working in an office and working with electronics and tools, um, you can simply measure the angle of a a roof slope. Well, you, it's not that easy in the field. You can't have a protractor that's 24 feet long. So what they devised roof slopes are simply based on units of 12. And I don't know, maybe it's 7. So that simply means for every 12 units you go up 7 and that will give you its slope. And it's very easy for a carpenter to figure out how to assemble these slopes based on these units of 12 measurements. <clears throat> and um, they can have both of these the same angles, which is recommended rather than have two different slopes on the same roof. The, um, and again, uh, the trusses are pre-manufactured. Uh, there is not that much conventional framing as you see here that's done uh, in the industry. Sometimes they'll do that for some larger areas for a single slope inside of maybe some family rooms or things of that nature. Um, and I think that will wrap it up for today. Thank you.